Hey guys, welcome to tonight's episode of Q&A with Dr. A. You know, I'm really excited with the fact that uh, we're about to transition to the end of the year and yet you guys keep pummeling us with questions in a good way. We love the fact that you're engaged, you're you know, curious and interested in, and really truly honestly challenging us in regards to finding out some great alternatives to different health aspects. So I just want to again applaud you and thank you for everything that you guys do keeping us fed with content and also curious questions. Don't forget that uh, next week's episode is the final of the year. Of course, we've been doing this week after week after week, and we have some amazing surprises coming forward for the following year. 2017 is going to be an incredible opportunity for you to not only get your uh, questions answered, but also potentially see some amazing turnaround in things in regards to shopping, eating, even some of the lifestyle patterns that we teach. So I'm Really just thankful right now for the fact that um, you guys are constantly asking questions, being engaged, and you know following along. So with that, let's get started with tonight's Q&A. First question we have is from actually one of our YouTube subscribers who watched one of my intermittent fasting videos. Just on a side note, if you don't realize, YouTube is where we generally push a lot of our video content, our health tips, even some of our Q&A sit there. So if you haven't been to our YouTube page, make sure you go check it out. We have all sorts of just fun little video clips and things that you guys can actually watch. But one of the videos I did was on the power of intermittent fasting. One of our users asked this question, can I take my total caloric intake over two meals between four and 10? And so I think what you're asking is, does it have to be noon to eight? And so the ultimate answer is no. So would four to 10 work? Yes. That's obviously about you know maybe a six hour eating cycle, so you're pushing about an 18 hour fast, which is fine. The only challenge to your question is my caloric intake. And remember, intermittent fasting has nothing to do with caloric intake, it has to do more with the percentages of fats to proteins to carbohydrates. You know, the classic sort of cellular healing diet is 60 to 65% fat, 30 to 35% protein, and only about 5% or less of carbohydrates, which would come naturally from things like your greens. You know, so when we say something like between four and 10, that's great, because you're keeping your eating window down. But I don't want you to think of your caloric intake of needing to get 1,600 or 1,800 calories in that time frame. Have a little fun with this. It's more about the types of foods that you eat than really the amounts that you eat. And in essence, again, remember the whole reason that this works is your liver is capable to sustain you for 16 hours. So if you're asking for it to do 18, all the more power to you. You know, if you want to talk about like beginner to intermediate to advanced, the beginner would be you've got to pull 16 hours off and that's between noon and eight. If I was going to push noon to say one o'clock, that's an intermediate. If I push it from one to four o'clock, now I'm going a little more advanced. There'd be nothing wrong with going till 10, but at the same token, there is a sort of natural circadian cycle to the way we eat. You know, food is supposed to be consumed sort of at different times. And so when we start eating at 11 or 12 or one o'clock, then we run the risk of actually undoing the massive effects of intermittent fasting. So when I talk about you and your four to 10 question, I don't have a problem with that. I just would say, I suggest pushing high, high amounts of fat. So MCT oil, coconut butter, avocados, and focusing on things that are clean proteins, grass-fed meats, free-range chicken, wild caught fish, you know, in our greens. If it's a green vegetable, then eat it. And I think that will really, really help a lot. So hopefully that helps to answer the question that you posted on YouTube. Next one says, I'm prone to diarrhea. and How do I sort of guard myself from this? But you know, the thing you got to remember with diarrhea, and it's something that we can have classically that starts because of just our body's natural response to sort of invaders. You have to look at it you know, the body's always going to do the right thing at the right time. So when we liquefy our stools, it's a means of rapidly getting toxins out. So under times when we're sick or we have a virus or we have a bacteria, you're naturally going to have an increased frequency or even liquefaction. But if it's sort of chronic sort of diarrhea, then we may want to look into things like electrolyte deficiency or not having the right amounts of specific vitamins, minerals, or nutrients. You know, one thing I see a lot with sort of those who are prone to diarrhea is an underlying infection on some sort of biotoxin side, either mold or even Lyme's disease. You know what happens a lot when people start to detox 
and they'll start saying something like, well, I was doing fine, and then about five weeks into my detox, I mean, I'm just going and going and going. That can be an indication that you're dumping too many toxins for what your bowels can handle. So often we use chelation products to sort of help to offset that. So activated charcoal, for example, or magnesium or fulvic acid can help to sort of bind the toxins that are being dumped. And so what we want to watch out for is looking at a symptom that the body has and thinking that it's something negative. It's, it's back to the old adage of, I have a fever, is that something bad? Not necessarily. I have diarrhea, I'm prone to diarrhea, is that something bad? Not necessarily. I think if anything, maybe for you, it hints that there's something more that needs to be done, possibly cleaning the intestines out, cleaning the liver out. I've, I've already talked a lot about diarrhea and things like that, obviously, on the different Q&As that I've done because it's a common topic to, for us to discuss. So if you would, just scroll down below the video and you'll find some more information, how coffee enemas can be helpful, how washing the intestines are good, but you know, it's not something that we want to have to have you experience, but it is something that's quite common, especially when we're going through a detox phase. The next one's kind of a fun question, mostly because it, it hints to the idea about how there are industries jumping onto the keto bandwagon or the intermittent fasting ketotic bandwagon. This is a, an email we received directly in regards to what do I think about the Keto OS, which is basically a product that has been produced that people are now sort of selling ketone bodies that you can consume. So Keto OS is a supplement that basically it's a powder that you could stir into a drink or put into a smoothie or something to that effect that boosts the beta-hydroxybutyrate amount in your blood. So beta-hydroxybutyrate is a version of a ketone body. And this company has said, listen, so many people are trying this whole keto diet. What if we could come up with a sellable ketone body supplement? Now, if you just think about it from that perspective, it's actually fantastic. There, I know a lot of people struggle with getting into ketosis or maintaining a state of ketosis. So if I can take a scoop of ketone bodies and swallow them and boost my ketone levels. I mean, that's fantastic. But you gotta remember, this stuff is kind of like an elite sort of exclusive product. It's about $85 for a bottle of ketone bodies. To me, the challenge is always this. Your body should be able to produce them by themselves. You know, if I look at a supplemental ketone body versus a naturally produced ketone body, I'm always gonna favor the naturally produced. The only analogy I could give you would be there's nothing wrong with taking vitamin D as a supplement, but your body can naturally produce vitamin D when you're in the sun. So should I stand outside when it's sunny for 15 minutes and let my skin get exposure and produce my own vitamin D that's actually sulfonated and better for you? Or should I just skip that and take a vitamin D supplement? You know, they both kind of do the same thing, but from my perspective, the body's naturally produced version is always better for you. So how do we naturally produce ketone bodies? Well, we fast. We do the intermittent style like the first question. Lots of fats, next to no carbs, and your body should produce its own level of ketones. You can check it by using a ketone monitor, which today, is, you know, thankfully the prices have come way down. You get a ketone monitor for about $30. So could you spend $85 and swallow this stuff religiously? Yes, you know, you can do that kind of stuff, but your body should be able to produce it on its own. The only way I would ever recommend like a keto OS or some sort of ketone supplement is if you're somebody who chronically has difficulty getting into ketosis or if you even have like say one simple green salad and you crash out of ketosis, you haven't fully keto adapted and so that's where those can become helpful. So I love the fact that we have a company who's jumping onto the health bandwagons and trying to at least support people. It's a necessary need but your body should be able to produce them on their own. Okay, so the next question says, I live in a rural area where the closest grocery store is Walmart with a 20 minute drive. Earth Fair, Earth Fair and Healthy Home Market are one and a half hour each ways. How do I get healthy food? You know, if we were to ask this question like say 20 or 30 years ago, the answer is suck it up and take a once a month trip, stock up on all the goods and drive back. I mean, this is pretty much what people had to do back then anyway. If we look at it today though, the advent of online markets like Thrive, and even different grocery stores that are online. You know, there's great resources today where they can ship frozen grass-fed beef and bones and all kinds of chicken and stuff to people. To make it simple, scroll down below this video and where it asks this question, what you're gonna see is actually a couple links for things like Thrive and Grassland Beef, etc. These are all great resources where you can get all of the organic foods that are non-perishable, coconut milk and coconut flowers and all the stuff that you would normally need to drive a distance for 
and they'll literally ship it straight to your house. And in fact, what you're going to find out is it's less expensive than it. What we naturally see is say like health food stores, Whole Foods, and Earth Fair and Healthy Home Market. The reason that they're taking off is that people are recognizing that there is a slight markup on these organic foods that are being sold at these organic markets. Now, if you buy from a massive store that can say source the entire U.S., when they buy in bulk, you get to save in savings. And even though Whole Foods is a national chain, they tend to sort of mark their prices up because they know that there's only one or two within your area. So I would suggest what you do is branch out to the idea of online shopping for food, which I know even right now today is sort of that archaic thought, like, are you serious? I'm not gonna drive to my grocery store and pick up my food immediately. I have to do it online. Well, it's a great resource for things that would naturally be long-term stable. So like canned items and bagged items and boxed items. But again, when you're looking at Thrive, these are gonna be things like your organic items and nuts and seeds and things like that that normally have a higher price. Now for you, if you're out in sort of like rural areas, you know, where there's probably more likely a lot of farms, you actually have a better answer than what we have here locally. Usually there's co-ops and farmers markets and things of that effect. So my suggestion would be get a lot of your local stuff on a regular basis. You know, you might even try calling around and finding out where other people shopping. Or if you're resourceful, you might even start your own sort of co-op where maybe you can even coordinate a monthly farmer's market or something and get people to come together in your hometown. I know that's how the Davidson Farmer's Market got started. It was a group of people who said, hey, listen, we want healthier food options. So all of a sudden, all these farms started coming together. And before you know it, we have this monthly effect where people get together from all over the state of North Carolina and they sell their food locally in one city. So, I mean, you may make that happen for yourself. Try to remember it's your resourcefulness, not so much the resources that you have locally that helps to determine the effect. So I think it's time to branch out and start finding out how to buy stuff online and how to create your own markets in your area. Plus, I think for you, if anything, you're probably close to certain farms and stuff like that. You'll get better food than what we can even find by going to a local grocery store. And if it is about an hour and a half or two, again, maybe it's a monthly trip. You come up, you stock up on your goods, and then you get your stuff locally. The next one's a tough one, guys. I got this from a truck driver who said, I drive between 16 and 18 hours on the road. I'm worried about my spinal health and just my health in general. What do you suggest for someone who works 16 to 18 hours on the road? And you know, this is a tough one just because classically, unfortunately, one of the major sort of concerns for a lot of truck drivers is that classic sort of truck driver diet, which is your, your classic sort of like drive throughs roadside diners. And I hate to say it, but a lot of the truck drivers I work with even confess that because time is always important for them, many of them just literally pull over on the side of the road at a, at a truck stop and just unload a vending machine and then off they go. Because often truck drivers get paid based upon just the delivery and also the time that they have, but they've got to stay within a certain time frame. If they drive over, then you know they start running the risks of having penalties or fees or anything like that across them. So it's a sad reality that we, we require a lot on truckers. And I mean, you guys are necessary for us to haul stuff around, but I never would look at your health being sacrificed as a result of that. So a couple things you can do. Number one, if you're worried about your spine, is if you're gonna be driving for 15 to 16 hours, you've gotta figure out some way to keep your spine moving. And what I do with a lot of our truck drivers is we teach the use of what's known as a wobble cushion. It's about a $15, $20 kind of item that you can use. And what it actually does is it lets you sit on it and basically wiggle and wobble around. It's a fantastic, simple device that you can put on your chair while you're driving. Secondly, something you can do is making sure that could you possibly sort of pack your own foods and have things that you could easily have with you. you know, some truck drivers have a tremendous amount of space in their cabin, and so keeping a cooler or keeping something regular for you to snack on so you're not having to constantly stop and eat sort of diner foods and stuff like that. You know, it's tough though, it's definitely hard. Make sure you drink enough water, you got vitamins and nutrients, anything you can do to sort of like hydrate yourself and keep yourself nutriently fed, and making sure that instead of driving for like say five hour intervals and then taking a break, Maybe you know pulling over on the side of the road for a 10 or 15 minute rest stop, but stretching and doing some spinal exercises. You know, as archaic as it may sound, if it's during the summertime, pop a blanket down on the grass at the truck stop and do some yoga, do some stretching, do some Pilates. I don't know, just something just to keep your spine moving. And then of course, at the minimum, 
If you're doing an overnight run or anything to that effect, using some sort of spinal pillows or spinal molds will help. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, truck driving is one of the most stressful sort of irritants to the spine because when we sit for long periods of time, we load the discs. And just inherently, as you'll probably agree, there's a general vibration that just happens to a truck just as a result of having a diesel engine and everything else. And they've even done studies on this that it vibrates at the same frequency that we would normally use to lessen and weaken a spine to allow it to be moved even better. So if you're constantly under a vibrational load and we're getting sort of the, a compression to the disc, it's why a lot of truck drivers deal with back pain and disc issues. So if you can sit on a disc and pump it around, if you can keep yourself nutrient rich, that's at least one step ahead of what everybody else is doing. Next question says, my husband suffers from prostate cancer and obviously we're both scared and we've tried to convince each other that we should go the route of not doing surgery, chemo and radiation, but there's a whole lot of risks associated with both doing it and not doing it. And I'm worried that chemo might make things worse or give a secondary cancer later on. How can I convince him that he should go the alternative route? You know, this is always hard because and from my viewpoint, I don't think you're ever going to be able to convince somebody to do something that they don't want to do. So just speaking truthfully about cancer, there's kind of three options you can do. You can completely go medical 100%. And if that's your decision, then that's what they're going to do. Okay. Unfortunately, it has about a 2% success rate. So what we're learning today is the conventional chemotherapy, radiation, surgery is not very successful. The problem is most people believe wholeheartedly in this. And if you wanna look more into sort of the dangers behind chemo, radiation, surgery, don't just take my word for it. There are great websites. One of the most famous is The Truth About Cancer. It's basically just type in Truth About Cancer and you're gonna find the website. It's Ty Bollinger's documentary series and website about all of the science behind the dangers of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. But it is a method, right? Second method would be to do everything alternative and holistic. No chemo, no radiation, no surgery, but focusing on those alternative therapies, hyperbaric oxygen, you know, detoxification, antiviral therapies, uh, antifungal therapies, chiropractic care, you know, IV chelation, IV vitamin C, rifing. I mean, all of the therapies that have been proven and studied scientifically but aren't medically available. So there's that box. And then the third box would be doing a combination of both of them. You know, so we have people who I currently work with that are getting chemotherapy, but they're also doing stuff with us to help us undo the negative effects of chemotherapy. My job as a health coach is not to tell you what you're supposed to do, but to help you with giving you the information you need to make the decision that's best for you. So if you're trying to convince your husband that you should go one way, we really need to kind of sit down and say, well, what does he want? You know, if he wants to go the medical route, but is only doing that because he doesn't know there's an alternative way, maybe the first advice would be just subtly get him exposed to some of the alternative methods. You know, like whenever I work with a cancer patient, the number one question I always ask is, have you asked your doctor what their success rate is with your condition? If you have lung cancer, for example, how many lung cancer patients have been cured under their therapy. And if you see them scrimmage or squirm and, well, you know, we can't really talk about that, it should make you wonder. You know, ultimately, what you want to look for is people who have survived with your type of cancer. And I'll just be the first to tell you if you find someone who has survived your cancer, it's about a nine out of 10 chance they didn't do chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Or they did, but they did some alternative methods at the same time. So, Maybe just opening the idea of that box could be helpful. Secondly, I guess the best thing would be is sometimes, unfortunately, I just hate to say this, and this is maybe just men in general, usually if somebody else tells them something, and I'm not trying to say this negatively against you because you know, you're, you're the spouse here, the wife specifically because it was your husband, but I don't know if it's just men in general, but sometimes if somebody else tells him, hey, listen, maybe you should look into this alternative therapy, he might go, oh, all right, let's do this. But of course, as you've been trying to do it, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, he'll listen and then you'll say, see, I told you the whole time. So I don't know, maybe finding another family member that could help somebody other than yourself just because third-party endorsement can be helpful with it. But I will say to you, we have amazing resources. I did a cancer summit back in October of this year. So perhaps you know you could go search for that again. It's on our YouTube channel. It's on our, our Facebook page. I believe it's even on our website. But I think for you, if you're watching tonight, and you know we have your contact info, so we're going to send it out to you. But 
you need to understand there's a whole nother world behind cancer. And in all reality, the successes come from doing the alternative and holistic paths. So I would just say, if he's curious about it, it doesn't mean you have to go 100% no chemo, no radiation, no surgery, but we need to figure out exactly what works for his type of cancer. You know, the thing behind prostate cancer is it's often typically a viral base or it's a hormonal base. So chemo does nothing for viruses or hormones, nor does, nor does surgery or radiation or anything of that effect. So you always want to get down to what was the cause? What caused this tumor? And then we can address it from that path. Next question in the final for tonight says, where do I come down on the whole idea of socialistic medicine? Which, you know, in and of itself is kind of like just a, an aha question. But I guess if I was going to say it, you know, the, the challenge for me is this. I think everybody keeps trying to ask the question of, What's the best insurance policy? You know, it happened the other day with a patient. They were like, well, if I had a better insurance, would they pay more for this? And the idea is, listen, no government, no policy, no plan is ever going to truly take care of your health because they don't have the correct definition of health. You know, when we look at what we want to be health, they're never going to go for that. You know, you're never going to find the government buying organic foods and teaching you how to do nutrient panels and walking you through intermittent fasting or helping you to understand what your body is supposed to do by itself. So looking at a socialized medicine where it's provided for you under some sort of governed healthcare system, the only answer for that would be what we're trying to do with Obamacare, which is if we can get everybody under an insurance policy, that will now all of a sudden fix healthcare because the thought is if you don't have insurance, then you're not going to the doctor and that's why you're so sick. But in reality, unfortunately, when you look at the stats, the more you go to the doctor, the more insurance you use, the more medicine you take, the more unhealthy you are. So if I was going to look at, say, the best socialistic medicine plan that we would have is to completely unearth the entire system. Make people responsible for their health themselves. Stop covering the fees and the tests and the stuff that we would do for symptomatic care. You know, it's unfortunate. We have patients that come in our office where Medicare would pay fully for the surgery to get something taken out of them, but they won't cover anything for them to do a nutritional program or a detoxification or chiropractic or physical therapy. And you often look at this and you say, why would they pay for this and not for that? It's because this view of health is what they believe health is. They'll pay for chemo, radiation, surgery, your medications, but if you're going to do something on your own, they're not going to pay for that. So my sort of like, what do I think of socialized medicine? I think if it got to the point where socially we took care of ourselves, we would have a massive turnaround in the overall health effects, but it requires an, an enormous overhaul on our system. Everybody would have to know what health is. Everybody would have to have access to being able to run tests on themselves without requiring a doctor to do it. And we'd have to be responsible to the point of where we paid for it ourselves. You know, if you look back to when 40, 50, 60 years ago, Retirements were something where you took money out of an account and the government backed it or your company backed it. Everybody put all their eggs into the 401k sort of IRA plans. Here we are today and what are we finding out? The whole system is about to crumble and we can't even support the federal fundings of the different sort of like pension plans that we have today. So why is that? Because everybody put all their eggs into one basket where we thought somebody else was going to watch out for us. You know, Social Security is crumbling, Medicare is falling apart, fees are going up left and right. And part of it is because if you ask for someone else to pay for you, the system is not designed to meet the customization needs on, on an individualistic basis. I look at the best sort of healthcare as you becoming your own doctor, you discovering what you need to do, and you taking care of yourself. Because ultimately, it's your health and it's your responsibility. What we do with the Ask Dr. Arts program, our radio show, our TV series, and everything else is my intent is to try to teach you what you should be doing so that you can have your health and have it outrageously. Hopefully you find that as a good answer. Ultimately, it's what I would do, but really it's your decision. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Don't forget, we have a special episode of the Ask Dr. Ernst Show this Saturday, 3 o'clock here on 1110 AM WBT. I am interviewing 107.9 FM's The Link's Jennifer Steele. She's one of their evening sort of um, radio show hosts. She had a massive transformation take place when she finally said, enough is enough. I'm sick of doing it all on my own by just eating right and exercising. She got introduced to our protocols, and in a few eight weeks, she's lost a tremendous amount of weight, and her whole life has turned around. She's going to share her story this Saturday at 3 p.m. Join us for that, 11 to 10 a.m. here in Charlotte. Until I see you guys next week, 
Have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.